Um, great. So I'm here with uh, Rick Perlstein. Uh, sir, thank you very much for joining me today. Pleasure being here. Um, so one of the problems that you run into a lot with political history is that it tends to either follow two extremes. One is it portrays its subjects as uh, you know, uncritical and glowing, or it's just hopelessly infected with bias. Um, but your three books chronicling the rise of the modern conservative movement are not that at all. Um, so, I mean, first off, why did you feel the need to write these books? I uh, came at this uh, as uh, a lifelong, or should, should I say, uh, sort of at least since my adolescence, an obsessive with the 60s. Uh, spent a lot of time, I always tell this story, um, at a used bookstore in Milwaukee called the Renaissance Bookstore, which was five stories tall. It was tumbling down and it had a basement full of old magazines. And I would just spend hours pouring through them uh, when I was in high school. And loved finding just strange books about the 60s, Black Panthers books, books by, you know, John Birch Society preachers, whatever. And uh, I was also had this kind of almost anthropological fascination with uh, people in America who came from a completely different perspective on the world that it would kind of be revealed to me on Sunday mornings uh, watching TV preachers. Uh, faith healers, Pentecostals, Hoopers and Hollowers. Um, and uh, by the time I was looking to write a history book when I was in my mid twenties, uh, all these kind of converged. Uh, I realized that uh, there was a ton of writing about the sixties, but none of it seemed to account for the fact that uh, first with Richard Nixon and then with Ronald Reagan, uh, the right wingers seemed to have be the ones who won. Right. And uh, so I started with Barry Goldwater. He, the, the story had never been told uh, how the movement around his presidential campaign uh, mm -hmm. really was the organizational galvanizing of lots of anti New Deal, anti civil rights, anti liberal forces. Um, and once I began studying it, I realized that there was a pretty coherent narrative to be told between uh, Barry Goldwater, the Republican nominee in 1964, and uh, Ronald Reagan's victory in 1980. Well, let, let's talk about that first book in the series, Before the Storm. Um, you you open the book describing a guy, I might be pronouncing his name wrong, but Clarence Mannion. Yes, um, and he resents FDR, hates the new government regulations. Uh, he had no say when your taxes ballooned to pay for Roosevelt's deficits, and eventually he falls in love with Goldwater. Uh, why start the book with a description of this particular person? That's a really interesting question. Uh, a lot of how one ends up kind of plotting a book can be very contingent. Uh, sometimes and you arrive at an interpretation because that happens to be the first book you grab in the library. Uh, in the case of Clarence Mannion, uh, I was researching in his uh, papers uh, at the Chicago History Museum, and I recognized in his correspondence with all these uh, businessmen from all over the country who shared an ideolo ideology with him, a social <laughs> type that was intimately familiar to me in that they represented the kind of ideas about the world that my father had. Uh, my father was a small businessman in Milwaukee, and he would always talk about uh, government regulators who really just resented his success and wondering, you know, why uh, there were homeless people when there were so many want help wanted ads in the newspapers. And in fact, a lot of the people who were uh, customers of my dad's were the same companies uh, now all swallowed up by uh, private equity and you know kind of manufacturing in places like Vietnam that uh, uh, were corresponding with Clarence Mannion. Uh, a lot of them were people who were uh, active in the John Birch Society. So I saw this kind of uh, familiarity. Uh, I circled around a set of questions I wanted to answer. Who were these people? Uh, what was their impact upon the world? And uh, 
the other reason was that uh, Mannion was the guy who started the organizing that sent Goldwater on his way to first publishing this book, Conscience of a Conservative, which was almost entirely a, a product of Clarence Mannion's organizing and imagination, much more than Barry Goldwater's, and then also uh, trying to draft him for president in 1960, uh, which started the whole thing. Um, I, I, rec I recognized him. I grew up in the Midwest, and uh, I saw a lot of these kind of small manufacturers who had these kind of, kind of regional fiefdoms who saw themselves as kind of these um, put upon uh, aristocrats. Right. And he it, it's interesting because he sort of seems to stand as a symbol of a potential Goldwater voter where he he's not the little guy in the sense of being you know on the poor end of the income scale, but he's also not the great industrial behemoth. And so he's re, has resentments on both sides. Um, Profile of a right wing organizer. Yeah. Uh, what about the intellectual foundation for the Goldwater conservatives? Um, people like William F. Buckley, who uh, supported uh, Goldwater, but he was also uh, very polite and articulate, went to Yale. Uh, what, what role did he play in this movement? Well, that's a really interesting question, and one in which uh, both my thinking and the thinking of my fellow historians has undergone a great deal of revision. I recently came back from the American Historical Association convention, the big annual historians convention this year, it was in New York. And there's lots of ferment uh, on a question uh, about uh, how the story historians had been telling about conservatism um, might need revision. I wrote about it in a uh, New York Times Magazine article that came out last year. Uh, a lot of us were kind of borrowing a story about the rise of conservatism that was one that the conservatives themselves told, which was that uh, basically people on the right in America um, before the rise of National Review in the mid 1950s uh, were full of kind of paranoid reactionaries, racists, anti-Semites, uh, basically lunatics and then National Review came along and turned this into a respectable movement. And uh, in fact, it turns out to be uh, much more complicated than that, that uh, National Review and William F. Buckley played a, played a very important role in getting conservatives taken seriously or taken more seriously uh, by sort of the mainstream media and kind of the gatekeepers of political society. Um, but that the coalition that brought Goldwater to the fore, uh, that within the coalition that brought Goldwater to the fore, that the kind of non-respectable so-called elements that uh, the National Review and William F. Buckley supposedly purged were equally important or in some ways more important. They might have been sort of like the, the point of the spear. They might have been uh, called them the vanguard. Um, William F. Buckley the more I study about the right uh, from sort of the 1940s and even going back to the 1920s and the present, the less important he seems except as a kind of intellectual validator, almost like kind of a Sherpa, you know, who's kind of like uh, standing in between uh, this kind of cauldron of right wing rage and um, the, the gatekeepers who tell Americans uh, what's respectable and what isn't. But, uh, you know, I think that, I don't think a lot of people were, not many people were getting their political marching orders from National Review. They were, they were reading Human Events, which was much more the activist magazine that kind of told people uh, how, how it was that the right could take back the country. Right, the uh, description of, of Buckley is a, a Sherpa. I've also heard the uh, phrase intellectual Zamboni of uh, sort of cleaning up the ice. Um, yeah. Yes, and the, the ice was a lot choppier than uh, historians have, have reckoned. Um, yes, to give an example, um, I'm reading a book about um, right-wingers who have carried out uh, who, kind of like a right-wing tradition since uh, the 1950s of uh, organizing 
paramilitary operations in communist held countries, right? Which is not exactly the sort of thing that uh, is safe to kind of take home to mother, you know? Right. That um, Goldwater himself was uh, widely recognized as being anti establishment, at least anti conservative establishment. And he won the nomination when, uh, before there was party reform and primaries and caucuses became much more open. So how did he how did he secure the nomination? Why wasn't the establishment able to block him? You're really an undergrad, Duncan? I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> skeptical here. You should get out more. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I was the same way. Uh, so, um, but I was, I was uh, obsessed with uh, kind of obscure left-wing organizations in the 1960s, which was what people were thinking about. When I was, you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s, people weren't really thinking about the importance of the right when it came to American political history. Uh, so, um, uh, yes. So that's a very fascinating part of the story. Um, the figure at the center of, center of it was a uh, a political uh, operative, really named F. Clifton White, who came out of the Young Republican movement, and uh, William F. Rusher, who was the publisher of National Review, and they kind of got together. And we're kind of disgusted by the moderates who are running the uh, Republican Party, the people who came out of Eisenhower. They favored this guy named uh, Robert Taft, who had been defeated by Eisenhower. And uh, they realized after Eisenhower left the White House that Eisenhower had almost become the Republican Party, that the actual organizations, the actual kind of clubhouses were very slack and, 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 and fallow. And that basically uh, taking over the party institutions and organizations, the county uh, meetings, the precincts from the ground up would be like, quote, uh, pushing on an open door. So uh, fascinating thing is uh, F. Clifton White had had run-ins in the 1940s with communist organizers and had seen them take over liberal organizations, uh, which was you know, really something that actually you know, happened. It wasn't just a Cold War fantasy. Uh, what they would do is they would, you know, show up at meetings. And you know, Trotsky still did this much, much, much later, and sometimes still do it. Uh, they would show up at meetings early. They would leave late. They would master parliamentary procedure. They would uh, master techniques for making themselves look like they had more people than they did. They would learn the rules, and uh, through hook or by crook, they would use methods to turn. Uh, basically a highly motivated minority into uh, the controlling faction. Uh, a lot of the ways in which uh, conservatives and Republicans use their minority status and still manage to maintain control in political organizations now, you can date to these techniques. So F. Clifton White took advantage of the fact that um, delegates for party conventions largely were chosen in these kind of closed door, small group meetings uh, that had become uh, uh, just very, um, very fallow. And uh, sedulously and uh, determinately and patiently and quite brilliantly, they were able to kind of put together this organization, you know, precinct by precinct, count by county by county, state by state until uh, almost before the Republican establishment realized what was happening under their nose, uh, Goldwater fans had taken over the Republican Party. And by the time they got to the convention uh, in the summer of 1964, they had a lock. And um, the people covering the convention even almost to the last inning, kind of just assumed that this thing was an epic phenomenon. This wasn't really happening. That this wasn't really real. Um, one of my favorite images in Before the Storm is one of these very, very establishment Republicans, Henry Cabot Lodge, who's classic wasp, you know, kind of old money guy who's dead, been very popular, you know, ambassador to Vietnam under Lyndon Johnson, shows up. He gets to his hotel room and he looks through the uh, list of the delegates. He says, I don't recognize any of these names, which was you know, completely a shock, completely a horror. And next thing you know, this guy who 
uh, if you look at the polls of what Republicans say they want a nominee represents very little of that uh, is the guy who they're putting forward against Lyndon Johnson in November. And in that election, he uh, he lost in the biggest popular uh, landslide in American history. I think it was like 61 percent of the vote or something like that. Um, why after that, it could have been very easy for that conservative movement to sort of fall apart or um, resolve to trim their sails and you know, maybe moderate. Uh, why did that not happen? Why did they keep fighting? Right. I mean, that's the transition from before the storm to uh, Nixon land. Why they kept fighting was because they believed they were fighting for civilization itself, right? I mean, they believed that uh, you know, a strong liberal state was, uh, you know, a violation of the very principles of liberty that uh, the world had been turned upside down. So they were never going to give up no matter what. I mean, they were like, in many respects, Bolsheviks, right? They'd keep on fighting. The reason the things they said in 1964 uh, that were, you know, anathema to the broad mass of American voters uh, had become much more acceptable by first 1966 and 19, and then by 1968 was basically the 60s happened. The world did seem to be turning upside down. Uh, my book, Nixon Land, starts with the Watts riots. It's only like a, a few days after Lyndon Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act and basically declares America's racial problems all but over that suddenly African Americans are, are burning down their neighborhood in Los Angeles and it's being covered live on TV. You know, uh, at Berkeley, students are uh, sitting down in the middle of campus. Uh, and uh, suddenly, the idea that liberalism brought social chaos uh, began to look like a, a message that you could take to the masses of voters. And the harbinger really was Ronald Reagan's success in 1966 at becoming governor. Uh, when he got the nomination, people were just as shocked as they had been at Barry Goldwater getting the nomination in 1964. But it wasn't, he hadn't won it by hook and by crook. He won it fair and square in a straight up election in which he was saying things like uh, people were uh, getting welfare and sitting on their porches uh, and not even trying to get a job. Saying things like uh, people should have a right to uh, uh, not rent or sell their homes to African Americans because it was their property and it was their business what they did with it. Uh, and saying that um, um, the response that college administrators should be having to protesting students was to kick them out. And this sounded pretty good to even blue collar working class voters who had traditionally been the base of the Democratic Party. So you 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 pick uh, the 1966 election of Reagan as a harbinger of what's to come, and Richard Nixon, of course, was the Republican nominee in 1968. Was he a Goldwater conservative, or did he learn some of these techniques uh, from Reagan? No, he was uh, very much uh, a pragmatist. I mean, what did he really believe? You know, you can only kind of find that in the interstices, right? Because politicians you know, form themselves in the political context that they find. I mean, I think he was actually uh, in his heart quite right wing. I think you can see that after he won his landslide in 1972 for his reelection and he submitted a, a budget that was very Reaganite. Of course, he never got to do much with it because Watergate soon happened. But in 1966, I found a really interesting document in uh, the Richard Dixon uh, library in which basically... Reagan wins the nomination, and Richard Nixon says, you know, I really should have him in for a little um, little chat, a little kind of training session about how he can win this election, because he's going to Washington. And he's giving a speech to the National Press Corps, and they're going to eat him up. And, well, lo and behold, Ronald Reagan does go and gives a speech to the National Press Corps, and he has these guys eating out of his hand. And so he's um, completely... Uh, shocking Richard Nixon. He maybe has a little bit more on, on the ball that he he had anticipated than a lot of people had anticipated. And lo and behold, he wins an election uh, saying a lot of the same things Barry Goldwater was saying. And 
uh, Richard Nixon was not the kind of person to uh, to poo-poo electoral success like that. Right. He's running in 1968. You know, he could have ran as he did in 1960, which was, uh, oh, I'm I'm more experienced. You know, I'm this thoughtful, wise guy who's you know met with a lot of world leaders. You know, uh, he was almost like a Me Too candidate. I'll do the stuff that the Democrats want to do, just you know, better and more efficiently. But instead, his his main appeal is, uh, I'm going to take the bull by the horns and restore law and order to the country. And uh, you, you know, you can see the you can see the commercials on YouTube. Um, it's very Reaganite. You really see Reagan, uh, uh, you know, kind of the student becoming the master, and Richard Nixon going to school on Ronald Reagan instead of the other way around. Right. And the the fact that he did lose, uh, Richard Nixon did, a presidential election before that and then became the Republican nominee again, um, he had a different strategy uh, the second time that he ran. But he also had some new image managers, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. Well, that's a fascinating story. Uh, it's told in a classic political book called The Selling of the President, which had a, a picture of Richard Nixon on a cigarette pack on the front. In other words, He's basically being bought and sold like a commodity in a supermarket. And one of the guys who uh, was responsible for this is a guy who went on to uh, greater or lesser things, Roger Ailes, the guy who founded Fox News, uh, a couple other guys. Uh, it's an amazing story. The guy who wrote it was named Joe McGinnis. He was uh, this wet behind the ears journalist who basically convinced the Nixon people to let him tag along. Uh, that he was kind of implied, they kind of thought he was a journalism student or something like that. And they didn't, he didn't really disabuse them of the notion. And suddenly he's a fly in the wall as these guys are um, mastering the most cynical techniques of media manipulation that anyone had seen to that point. Uh, they do something, uh, uh, basically they invent these kind of fake town halls that make it look like Richard Nixon is, you know, kind of taking on all comers when it's really this incredibly controlled environment. Uh, they do things like have him give only one speech a day uh, before a very big audience and then immediately uh, and have it near the airport so that uh, the TV news crews can immediately ship the film cans because there was no video and there was no, you know, kind of Wi-Fi, you know, so they had to actually ship the film to New York. And the only thing that they could have to put on the air was this one very polished speech, whereas the Democrats were doing what basically presidential campaigns normally did, which was to have 10, 20 speeches. And what you would see on TV from uh, the Democrats was his one mistake of the day, that kind of stuff. So Richard Nixon, uh, you know, basically uh, affected a quantum leap in the kind of artifice in campaigning that year. And of course, the guy who, one of the guys who helped put it together was the guy who, uh, you know, brought another quantum leap in artifice to American campaigning when it came to creating Fox News. Right, Roger Ailes. Um, and he, he was, he, I believe you described this in the book too, where a young Roger Ailes is helping him in the makeup studio. And Richard Nixon is saying, you know, oh, I don't care for this TV stuff. And he goes, if you think that, you're going to lose. He said, if, you, if, if uh, the, you, you could tell you don't care about that, that TV stuff. That's why you lost in 1960. And Richard Nixon knew that, you know, one of the biggest reasons he, John F. Kennedy was able to kind of present himself as uh, a credible presidential candidate was that he had done so well in the first televised uh, presidential debate in 1960 and that Richard Nixon had done so poorly. Um, it's important to put in the context of the Vietnam War here. Uh, yeah. did, did Nixon and Kissinger help sabotage uh, peace negotiations? Absolutely. There's, 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 there's no, as, as much as you can kind of prove something in the past, this has been proven. Uh, we have uh, the cables proving it. We have the documents proving it. We have, uh, now we have uh, Haldeman's notes. Uh, this, that's Richard's, uh, Richard Nixon's main aide, Bob Haldeman, uh, proving it. That, that basically, um, uh, through an intermediary, uh, a message was uh, conveyed to our allies in South Vietnam, not to uh, resolve the war or the election, Richard and uh, that might have 
made the difference. Who knows if whether there would have been a peace deal or not. Uh, but there's no question that uh, the intent of Richard Nixon was to sabotage uh, the end of the Vietnam War. And of course, we had five more years of war and about 40, you know, was 30,000 more deaths under Richard Nixon. The um, the protests against the the war during Nixon's presidency became uh, sort of a, a focal point of this culture war uh, culture war politics, um, and you describe these construction workers in the book who beat up the anti-war demonstrators with their hard hats. Uh, why was that important to mention? One of the things that made it so important uh, was that again these are blue collar union members that had formed the base of the New Deal coalition. And if the Democratic Party is seen as the party in alliance with these anti-war protesters who are kind of breaking with the decorum and order uh, by protesting in the streets, then suddenly these voters might be up for grabs. And symbolically, it was very powerful because not only were there construction workers doing the beating up of the students, but there were Wall Street brokers as well, who kind of poured out of their audience, uh, their 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 um, their offices, and did the same thing. So what you see is kind of this uh, symbolically. Uh, you you kind of you can visualize this new coalition. Certainly, Richard Nixon visualized this new coalition of t- traditional Republican voters. In other words, you know, kind of Wall Street brokers, businessmen, and traditional Democratic voters, allying. Uh, against uh, a Democratic Party that was uh, seemed to be in bed with uh, people who hated America, right? And uh, you hear all kinds of conversations between Nixon and especially um, uh, his kind of political enforcer, Chuck Colson, saying that this is it. We're going to get rid of the Democratic Party. These guys are finished. Uh, and that very much is the coalition that Richard Nixon puts together in 1972 that gives him a landslide in 1972, which is just as big as the landslide that uh, Lyndon Johnson had in 1964. What was the story of that landslide? A lot of the people, uh, a lot of commentators today say that uh, McCarthy, the Democratic uh, candidate, was a, um, the reason he lost was because he was a uh, a far left. (laughs) George McGovern. uh, Excuse me, George McGovern. Um, uh, Reason he lost was a far left candidate and uh, he was the uh, candidate of acid, amnesty, and abortion. Um, Was that an accurate description of why he lost? Well, it's complicated like most things in history, but um, a lot of uh, kind of the people who were uh, telling the story of American politics in the media were very enamored of the idea that the sort of new sort of voter, uh, they called the new politics, uh, kind of imbued with this in a sense of youthful idealism and the idea that the old structures of politics were ossified and out of date and that uh, 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 there was kind of a new kind of politics of morality that was kind of taking the floor. Um, uh, the idea that this was kind of this unstoppable force, you know, turned out to be uh, um, was almost entirely incorrect. Uh, the pundits, one of the ways, many, many ways I show in my books that the pundits usually get things wrong. It's useful to remember that in 2022, 2020 as well. So, um, you know, George McGovern was very much an avatar of uh, these new forces of reform. And um, he, I don't think he really saw himself as adversarial to the, the, the old coalition, the New Deal coalition, but the old New Deal coalition, a lot of the people at the center of it certainly saw him as adversarial. For example, uh, the guy who was in charge of the AFL-CIO, the big labor federation, really kind of identified with uh, those 1970 hard hats. He was horrified by George McGovern. He was horrified that he uh, had formed an alliance with uh, the anti-war movement. Now, by that time, pretty much everyone agreed that the Vietnam War was a bad idea. And one of the reasons Nixon was so successful in kind of co-opting a lot of this anti-war energy was that he basically promised that he was going to end the war in an honorable way, and that if a Democrat like George McGovern became president, he would end the war in a dishonorable way. Basically, he would surrender. Uh, George McGovern had said that he would be willing to get down on his knees and beg for peace if it would end the war. Uh, so, you know, Richard Nixon, as a very shrewd, skillful politician, played all these elements to the hilt. And a lot of the elements in the old Democratic coalition, like, again, George Meany, 
but also uh, Hubert Humphrey, the 1968 nominee, um, withdrew from the Democratic campaign. Uh, so it was very hard on election day for George McGovern to kind of call home the traditional Democratic voters and the new Democratic voters, these young idealists, uh, turned out to follow a pattern that we're much more familiar with now. This is the first election in which 18-year-olds could vote. There was a new constitutional amendment, and that was supposed to uh, cause this rush to the Democrats, but it turned out that they voted in very few numbers. And in fact, Richard Nixon uh, uh, received more votes among voters between the ages of 18 and 21 than George McGovern did. Uh, it was just kind of assumed that young people would all be... Uh, you know, liberal sympathizers, and that simply wasn't the case. I believe that this was mentioned in your book, but uh, Richard Nixon, I think, said about uh, George H.W. Bush and um, uh, the uh, you know Operation Desert Storm that he should have kept the war going through the election. Uh, yeah, right, I mentioned that in the book. He, he uh, told that to uh, Maureen um, Dowd uh, in the early 1990s. Yeah, I mean, that was the kind of cynicism we saw from Richard Nixon. I mean, there's, you know, everyone knows about uh, the way he sabotaged the Paris Peace Talks in 1968. Uh, I found uh, an interesting piece of information that as early as 1966, he didn't even think the Vietnam War uh, was, was possible as a victory for the United States. Uh, so he really understood that this whole thing was a sham, even even then, uh, and was willing to kind of countenance you know, the slaughter of Americans and Vietnamese uh, because it just uh, was more politically propitious to say that. The, the, the night that he wins re-election, as you said, massive landslide, um, and 49 out of 50 states, but you describe how even on that night, he's still unhappy. Um, what, what is the psychological... Uh, I, I know we can't crawl inside this guy's mind, but it, it, what is the explanation for that? Yeah, I've been spending a lot of time crawling inside his mind. And, uh, <laughs> I have the nightmares to prove it. Uh, <laughs> and of just profound resentments. Uh, uh, in a lot of ways, you know, he bears a lot of resemblances to Donald Trump, this insecurity that he's not smart enough. Of course, he's brilliant. That's one difference with Donald Trump. But... Um, Ever since basically his college days, he had always uh, courted popularity by kind of uh, making himself kind of uh, uh, sort of the king of the nerds, right? The people who felt condescended to by the hip, suave elites. Uh, it's like the revenge of the nerds scenario, right? And, uh, you know, he's the guy who uh, is saying that all these suave cosmopolitan liberals from the Northeast who think that, you know, you guys are dumb and shallow, knuckle dragon, you know, kind of uh, 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 um, reactionaries. Um, I'm with you. You know, I'm really, I, I, I see that you're, that you're what, what he called the silent majority, you know, which is an opposition to the loud minority, right? That's what he called the liberals, or he implicitly called the liberals. And that's a very uh, tricky psychological operation because all that means is that if you win, <laughs> you know, you've kind of, uh, all you've proven to yourself is that, you know, basically um, your identity with the losers <laughs> and, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the nerds of society is complete, you know, uh, it'll always be a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, and he always felt himself inferior uh, no matter how much power he achieved. I mean, he's literally the most powerful man in the world with the biggest landslide ever. And he still feels somehow this kind of psychic hole at the core of his being. Uh, it, none of these guys who run for president, these men and women are, are kind of normal in their psychological operations, but he was definitely a, one of the strangest. He didn't seem to have any uh, genuine connection with human beings uh, at the same time as he was in this profession in which you know, basically working for and with human beings is the entirety of the enterprise. Right. And there's a, uh, he, he said something at one point before he ran for a second time that I'd do anything to be president except go see a shrink, which is the one thing that might have helped. Yeah. 
Yeah, he, he saw shrink and uh, the shrink actually during Watergate wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, the speaking of Watergate, uh, Barry Goldwater was one of the senators, uh, I believe, who told Nixon eventually that he had to step down. Uh, do you think if he had resisted at that point that he could have saved his presidency? Uh, no, because uh, he um, really made it impossible to for anyone to any any person with any kind of clarity to understand anything other than the fact that he had um, lied to them directly. You know, sometimes you know when it came to senators, you know, in face to face meetings. I mean, uh, of course, he'd been lying ever since Watergate began, because right after the burglary, he had began actively, you know, plotting a cover up for his aides, you know, literally within hours. We now, now know that to be the case. And he always claimed he had nothing to do with it. But it really kind of came to a head in the last few days before his resignation, when the Supreme Court said, uh, basically, he had no right to hold back uh, the tapes of his Oval Office conversations. So like many, many more conversations than uh, the prosecutors that had previously suddenly were part of the public record. And one of the things they discovered was that he had directly said, very directly, that I had nothing to do with something very specific, which was um, at the beginning of the cover-up ordering uh, the FBI to cease investigating because this was a CIA operation. But on the tape, he was heard saying we should get the FBI to cease investigating by saying this is a CIA operation. It was so blatant. Uh, that was what was called the smoke, smoking gun, that anyone who denied it uh, sounded absolutely ridiculous. Now, there was very famously one right-wing congressman from Indiana named Earl Langreeb, who was most famous previous to that for uh, smuggling Bibles into the Soviet Union. Uh, who did deny it. He went on the Today Show the day before uh, Nixon resigned and said, uh, I'm going to support my president even if you have to take me outside and shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> a little like a Donald Trump at Fifth Avenue. And he said, uh, don't confuse me with the facts, right? Uh, I, I joke that Errol Langry would, would, would now be uh, uh, acceding to the, the, the head of the Republican leadership cadre now. But back then, it was seen as seen as a very shameful thing to kind of deny the reality that was right in front of everyone's nose. So we have kind of a repeating pattern here, where after Nixon leaves, there are a lot of premature um, uh, you know, announcements of the death of the right wing, and of course, Ronald Reagan or uh, Barack Obama won too. Right, um, and Ronald Reagan. Uh, you book I, the last line of the book is you know nixon land still going on and then obama won and people said rick rolstein is wrong obviously obama proves that this politics of right-wing resentment is no longer viable oh people were saying that afterwards mm -hmm. yes wow. sir. apologies oh that's uh i mean that's got to be some bitter apologies to take though um that's welcome to my world <laughs> the um the, the title of, uh, of the book about Reagan is called The uh, Invisible Bridge. Uh, first off, just because I love this story, can you explain where that title comes from? Right. I took a little liberties with it. Um, very famously, one of Richard Nixon's greatest uh, kind of uh, public relations accomplishments, which was engineered by uh, a guy named William Sapphire, who later became a rich, Richard Nixon speechwriter, was that he kind of had this kind of stage confrontation with uh, the head of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, at a kind of a World's Fair in Moscow. It was called the Kitchen Debate. And one of the things that kind of uh, Nixon said to him, uh, uh, what Khrushchev kind of gave him this kind of political advice off the record. <laughs> they have this kind of, you know, sort of intimate conversation about how to govern a country. And Khrushchev says, uh, when the people think that there's uh, an imaginary river out there, don't tell them there it doesn't exist, build an imaginary bridge. So I kind of took the liberty of calling that the invisible bridge. And, you know, what Khrushchev seemed to be suggesting is basically uh, politics is ultimately all about uh, agreed upon illusions and that the candidate who can kind of bullshit the most effectively and the most with the most conviction is the person who uh, has the advantage in a political contest. 
And to me, that's a, a metaphor for uh, Ronald Reagan's political appeal. A guy who uh, always uh, could see sort of a, a bridge to a more optimistic future, even amidst uh, all evidence to the contrary. Uh, and, you know, the book starts at a time in which America has kind of lost a war and very soon has kind of lost its faith in the presidency and lost its faith in its economic future because it's being held hostage by uh, Arab oil kingdoms who embargo our oil. And here's Ronald Reagan saying, actually, there's uh, nothing <laughs> going on here that, you know, good old American gumption and know-how and idealism and and faith in God and the family and, and the flag can't fix. You describe that as an almost official cult of optimism uh, of Reagan. Why was that an effective strategy? Well, it was effective in that uh, uh, America has a very uh, dark, 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 uh, structures of power in its founding and its in its history and its present and uh that the american people have always had a hard time kind of staring into that abyss and facing it and uh, you see it um you know all the time and in the preface of the book i talk about how um Barack Obama's nominee for UN ambassador, uh, Samantha Powers, uh, talked about the crimes in, the, in, in America's past. And in order to win her nomination, when she was asked about that quote, she basically had to kind of swallow her pride and say, no, uh, I didn't mean it. America's the greatest country ever, and it's never done anything wrong, basically. Which is uh, something people who uh, aspire to power uh, positions of great power in the United States almost have to all say as a, as a kind of ritual enunciation in order to kind of pass muster with the gatekeepers of uh, American political power. And that's uh, very much um, uh, the, the kind of uh, Rubicon that the United States faced after the Vietnam War and during Watergate was whether it would begin to acknowledge the more complex uh, um, ambiguities uh, in its national project, or whether it would just find a way to uh, to smile them away. And to me, Ronald Reagan's role was to help Americans accomplish the latter. And Reagan had gotten, uh, I don't know if you'd say his start in politics, but certainly influential for his image making was the, um, the General Electric theater That's uh, right. commercials that he did. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, a scholar, a media scholar calls uh, Ronald Reagan's kind of five minute commercials that would 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 appear in between the halves of these the, these uh, General Electric Theater presentations as the TV's first reality show, uh, which meant, of course, that there was no reality at all. Basically, uh, in the 1950s, uh, when his career as a movie actor was really um, uh, uh, flatter than a pancake. Um, he received the job as a corporate spokesman. General Electric uh, hired him to go from facility to facility to give kind of, kind of inspiring pep talks to their employees. They didn't intend the job to be particularly political. He would mostly tell stories about you know his uh, Hollywood years. Um, but he was becoming more and more political. He was becoming more and more right wing. He was making his transition from liberal to conservative, uh, which is you know another complicated story in itself. But by the end of the 1950s, when he's also hosting their half an hour uh, anthology show, anthology shows were kind of like the Twilight Zone or um, what's the one they have now? Um, Black Mirror. Yeah, like Black Mirror, where there's a kind of a different episode. Uh, they don't have the same actors. They don't have the same characters. Uh, they're like little miniature movies every week. And Ronald Reagan would introduce them. And then he would do these commercials in between. And uh, one of the things uh, he would do is um, General Electric bought him a gorgeous house with all the latest General Electric appliances. And he would kind of show up in his family with his family and his little kids uh, and kind of pretend to be going through their lives with their wonderful home of the future. And that really, uh, much more than his career as a movie star, uh, 
made him a household figure because it was one of the top rated shows for year after year after year. Running for governor, so I think it was the image that people had in their minds was this kind of friendly suburban dad, very much like the kind we saw in you know kind of 1950s and 60s sitcoms like Leave It to Beaver. The guy who um, presented an image of the kind of safe, secure world behind the secure white picket fence uh, that was kind of going to fend off all the frightening things that were happening in the world. That was uh, the Ronald Reagan that entered politics in the 1960s. Uh, you spoke about him going around these uh, General Electric factories. Uh, wh- what what political lessons did he learn uh, giving these these sort of talks and speaking to these like workers and things like that? Well, it was very interesting. The guy who was his mentor at General Electric was an influential figure that whose name really doesn't doesn't go down in history, uh, but he. Uh, he was very uh, influential in that his name was Lemuel Bulware. I should, you know, kind of call his name. He was uh, in charge of kind of public relations and also labor relations for General Electric, and he saw those things as absolutely tied together in order to win, uh, to defeat uh, the union, uh, hopefully to break the electrical union, which was one of the most radical. Uh, he really. Uh, developed very sophisticated um, sort of um, uh, public opinion techniques to get blue collar workers to identify with the company as their salvation rather than the union. Uh, And basically was very sophisticated in using things like focus groups and publications and even comic books to teach working class people to think like capitalists. Basically teaching uh, working class factory workers to uh, become conservatives. Now, when Ronald Reagan ran for and won the presidency in 1980, which is, by the way, the subject of my next book, which comes out in August, it's called Reaganland. And you can break some news here, Duncan. It's coming out on August 4th. Uh, there we go. <laughs> he uh, was elected with the Democratic, the defection, again, just like in 1966 for governor, of voters that were labeled Reagan Democrats, uh, blue collar workers uh, that basically had been persuaded by Ronald Reagan to think like conservatives. And this was, these were techniques, I argue, that he learned at the feet of this guy, Lemuel Bulware. And uh, these speeches that he began giving to uh, workers at the plants were his workshop. Not only the way what he said, but uh, as a person who basically was very good at picking up at the cues of his audience of what worked and what didn't, what he heard uh, uh, in return from uh, which arguments work best, which stories work best, which images work best, which tropes work best. Uh, and so by the time he's basically fired for General Electric from becoming too right wing and actually uh, arguing against the interests of the corporation that hired him, for example, um, when it came to uh, arguing against public power plants uh, that GE sold giant turbines for, um, he not only was a dyed-in-the-wool conservative himself, he, better than anyone else at the time, understood how to speak about conservative values to working-class audiences whose loyalties had been formed out of the New Deal for the Democrats. Um, So it's easy to see the straight line from Goldwater to Nixon to Reagan all of them conservatives and all of them campaigning on a, on a culture war. Do you see a continuation of that trend as it pertains to Trump, or do you think he's a, more of a historical anomaly? Well, I mean, Trump is uh, such a perfect example of kind of the cliche you learn in History 101, which is that history is the study of continuity and change, right? Which is kind of like, 
is a big way of saying nothing. But in a sense, there are so many continuities uh, between Donald Trump and this uh, this tradition that I'm talking about that even the language is the same. You know, I have a I have a sign that I got at a Trump rally from New Hampshire from 2016, which says, uh, you know, Donald Trump is for the silent majority or something like that. Right. Uh, he's talked about law and order. He used the same language as Nixon. Uh, you know, he has the same class grievances as Nixon, as Reagan, as uh, Sarah Palin, you know, as Newt Gingrich. But at the same time, he rec- represents uh, a very fascinating and complex transformation in that previous generations of conservative spokesmen uh, were much more concerned with um, uh presenting a respectable face to the media elites. And so that's where you get uh, this tradition of what we now know as the uh, right wing, you know, dog whistle to speak to uh, grassroots kind of bigotries and resentments in a way that if they were uh, expressed in a full throated way, say uh, black people are lazy and don't want to work would, uh, or that immigrants, you know, are all drug dealers and rapists would, uh, uh, disqualify uh, a politician from serious consideration, uh, but which Donald Trump is uh, willing to transform into uh, not just a, a, a dog whistle, but what we, you know, heard people call the train whistle, right, saying it out loud. And uh, how and why that transformation could and did happen is really kind of the next frontier of under- understanding the evolution of the rise of the right within the Republican Party. That's kind of where we're at. Uh, why could that happen? What was the role of Democrats? What was the role of the media? Uh, was this this inevitable uh, kind of ratcheting more and more in a right-wing authoritarian bigoted direction? Um, and you know, we're still trying to figure that out. And um, what will happen next uh, is you know remains to be written. One of the explanations for uh, the rise of Trump that's been offered is that the Republican Party has activated their base, um, throwing like red meat to them every election cycle, and then the adults sort of come into the room and take charge, like Mitt Romney, uh, when, you know, during the uh, 2012 primary, a lot of people like Michelle Bachman could have gotten the nomination, but eventually the establishment took over and I secured. About that was going to happen any day now. Right. But you also heard that in 1964, that the establishment was going to kind of take charge any day now. And, you know, this Reagan, this, this Goldwater stuff would, would, you know, would, would go away, you know, once the grownups, you know, kind of took charge. But, you know, why doesn't that happen? Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. That's another interesting question that we don't have the best handle on. Uh, last thing I wanted to ask you. So you have a new book coming out. Um, and you've uh, you've broken some wonderful news on this podcast about it. Um, when uh, can people uh, go and pre-order it uh, already? Or, or uh, it it? It's uh, I'm sending it out for the copy editor in a couple of weeks. I would say it'll be available for pre-order probably uh, sometime uh, late spring, early summer. Great. Um, anything else you you want to mention, or do uh, you have a website people can find you at? Uh, I Twitter at Rick Perlstein and uh, pretty much full up with Facebook friends. They have a 5,000 person ceiling. So you probably couldn't squeeze in, but I'd love to hear from you on Twitter. Okay, great. Um, well, Rick, thank you very much for your time. This was a very enjoyable conversation. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, stay in touch. Definitely. Cheers. Alrighty. Cheers.